Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW LP Brattleboro 107.7 FM, your community radio station. I am your host, Olga Peters, and as always, we will be talking about how things in Montpelier shake out for Wyndham County. And today we will be talking with regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, who is one of the state representatives for Brattleboro, as well as Karen Tronsgaard Scott, who is the Vermont Net who is with the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, as well as Sherry, who is an advocate with the Women's Freedom Center. And just for those of our our viewers who are watching us on YouTube, if you're wondering why Sherry doesn't have her, her photo up, it's because for safety reasons, the advocates at the Women's Freedom Center do not uh, appear on camera and they do not use their last names. So, um, but we are lucky to have her voice and her contribution today. So welcome Karen and welcome Sherry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. So we want to touch on what I think for most of our listeners will be a tough subject. And that is in very broad strokes that during this lockdown, while most people retreated to their homes to be safe from the uh, COVID-19, home is not always a safe place for everybody, both people in uh, violent partnerships as well as many children. Um, and so we want, we want to make sure we give space for that because while so much attention has been placed on being home and being safe, we need to remember that that is not the case for everyone in our community. Um, Karen, I would love to start with you. If you could give us a, a statewide snapshot of, you know, for, for folks who are not, um, uh, not not to say not aware of domestic violence, but it's not part of maybe their everyday life. Can you can you just kind of lay the framework for for our listeners? Sure. Uh, so domestic violence is actually a pervasive problem in our state, uh, and folks, it, because it's hidden, folks may not know that it's a pervasive problem. We know that uh, at least uh, between eight thousand and nine thousand people, victims of domestic violence, come forward every year to get services from 15 nonprofits like the Women's Freedom Center that provide services and supports for survivors of domestic and sexual violence in our state. Um, so when the state locked down, when everybody went into lockdown, these 15 organizations immediately pivoted to um, providing remote services to the extent possible. Most of these organizations operate shelters, emergency shelters, so they could not they obviously couldn't close down those emergency shelters. So staff continued to provide services within shelters, but the, um, and then they pivoted toward providing support services via um, remote, like, you know, Zoom and phone calls. It's pretty remarkable, I thought, that none of these nonprofits shut down at all. The services were still available. Advocates were out there in the communities, making sure people had food, making sure they had all the supports that they needed. Um, but you know, we know that eight, between eight and 9,000 people come forward every year. That's a large number of people in our state. And we know that that's not everybody. In fact, that's probably not even the majority of survivors that are living in homes in our state who are subjected to um, coercion and, um, and violent abuse. I'm, I'm curious, Karen, and, and share if you want to weigh in on this. What, how do I want to phrase this? Why is domestic violence so hidden? Um, or, or what keeps it hidden? Like, is it, is it the way violence tends to operate? Is it the way our community tends to view domestic violence? Like, it, it seems like such a horrible thing. It, how could it stay hidden, I guess, is what I'm kind of struggling with. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that Sherry answer this question. She is uh, an incredible advocate and a great expert. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, what you really underlined there, um, Olga, is the fundamental, you know, issue right here. How has it managed to stay so hidden? And I think it's helpful to remember, um, you know, first for folks who maybe aren't as familiar, um, we're the domestic and sexual violence resource organization for Wyndham and Southern Windsor counties, but we're not that unique. Um, you know, we are 46 years into this movement now, but across the country, 
a lot of organizations, you know, are that old, a lot of these early grassroots organizations. So the activism um, has been going on now for multiple generations and so, you know, certainly before that too. But what we're up against is still some of the same age old thinking, right? So some of it to answer your question, how has it remained hidden? We have to remember that when the Women's Freedom Center, for example, you know, um, first became an organization, it was still revolutionary back then to even name the fact that you had been harmed by your partner. There was such incredible shame attached to that and there still potentially could be. So one answer to how, how does this stay hidden when it's so toxic is all of these societal um, myths that still blame and shame victims um, and then on and on systemically, right? If there's not a lot of help out there, it can be enormously difficult to try to get out of that situation, but sort of closer to home, it stays hidden because that's how it works for batterers, right? There's the actual tactic happening within that home and what has been really, um, you know, just uh, an enormous challenge added to what survivors go through anyway, which is potentially isolation in the home, is now that we're all kind of isolated at home and kind of touch on what Karen said in terms of the numbers around the state. Um, just as an example, you know, last year alone, the Women's Freedom Center responded to over 2,200 hotline calls. In the first couple weeks of the pandemic, of the lockdown, our numbers radically dropped to 50% fewer. And in any other kind of situation, that might be a welcome silence, but this was an ominous silence, right? We knew that this doesn't mean that we suddenly have abusers, you know, becoming more compassionate and, you know, holding off that kind of thing. We knew that we were still waiting for the untold stories and they have yet to really come out. You know, we're still waiting. The numbers have definitely picked up and I'm sure Kari can talk too about around the state. Um, it's gone up, but so there's the isolation that happens within the dynamic of, you know, power and control and silencing someone. And there's the fact that our culture has just continues to be slow to um, acknowledge the kinds of privilege that keep not only sexism, gender-based violence, racist violence, um, you know, in play in our culture. So it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge topic, obviously. Thank you, Shari. Emily. Um, I'm really curious about when you, um, Shari, you named the idea of one of the reasons that this happens and stays so hidden is resources aren't as available. Um, and so I'm curious to think about what those resources are, because I think they're more, um, I think they might be more complex than some of our listeners might think of them. You know, what comes to mind is, you know, the dynamics around relief from abuse orders, um, the dynamics around housing, the dynamics around access to sort of technology and communication. Um, but I know that there's more than that. And I was wondering if we could build that out a little bit and talk about um, what it means to access those resources, sort of, and what we've learned from the pandemic as we access, as those resources became harder to access, like what got magnified, I guess. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the pandemic certainly across the culture has kind of exacerbated the stresses people were already living with, right, for any number of reasons. So certainly for domestic violence, and you just named some of the core ones right there, um, long-term housing, you know, one of the knee-jerk reactions people might have when they hear about domestic violence is, you know, why, and it's typically female, but just to underscore, the Women's Freedom Center is committed to supporting survivors of all genders who've experienced domestic or sexual violence or sex trafficking. But again, typically the quick questions are, you know, wow, if that happened to me, I would just be out of there. You know, why doesn't she just leave? That question, you know, keeps haunting the conversation because I think people don't realize all the things, all the challenges in the way for survivors. So accessing um, you know, affordable housing can be challenging for any of us, but then for a survivor who's come from all kinds of struggles and trauma, that's huge, especially in the state of Vermont, you know, living more rurally, it can be a little more difficult to be able to access supports. Um, you know, consequences for perpetrators who, you know, maybe um, are sort of in and out um, of any sort of you know incarceration if that even happens for them it really as soon as you look at any one strand and take it all the way out you see that we still have for all the progress we've made we still have a long way to go um in in every system in in our culture basically one um aspect of that that i feel very hyper aware of lately because of some of the other conversations i've been having is um 
the lack, the lower economic mobility of women, um, and especially um, women who are further marginalized because of class or race or culture. And so we have a society that, you know, our economic system makes it almost impossible for a single person to make it financially. Um, and coming out of a life that might be built, built you know, with two incomes um, or with white male income becomes incredibly difficult to transition to a life without that, especially if children are in the home. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and then if you add additional layers, I mean, that's challenging, um, you know, for any single parent, let's say, um, if you happen to be white, but then you add other social challenges, right? Um, women of color, right? The, the pay comparison between white men, um, it's, it's drastic. It's drastic. We still have quite a ways to go. So, you know, there's that. Absolutely. I mean, you know, gender and poverty is a whole other show, obviously, potentially, right? All of those different things. But for survivors, um, they're not even starting at that challenging point. Um, typically, survivors have already gone through a number of, you know, they've experienced the tactics of batterers, which almost always include some form of economic um, oppression, of whether it's you can't get a job, you're not allowed to work outside or they sabotage that job by, you know, harassing the person while they're at work or, you know, they're, they're dealing with abuse at home. So it's harder to hold down a steady job or their rental history gets trashed because of the situation, you know, on and on, like literally um, each of these would be sort of an itemized list of the challenges that survivors face. And yet, you know, let's also really highlight they do it every day with all of these, this, it's an obstacle course to dig out from that very often. And, you know, again, we're not alone. We know that amazing advocates around the country do this work and amazing survivors also skillfully do the work to get themselves out from under this mountain of, of challenges um, because they're not starting at zero when they leave a domestic violence situation. There's a lot of um, sort of cleanup and repair kind of work in their lives that still needs to happen. Karen, how about uh, from what you're seeing at the at the state level, um, has COVID changed anything or or informed how how you do how you're doing your work at all? Well, I, I, COVID has changed um, some things. COVID has unveiled much about um, what's happening to Vermonters and especially Vermonters who live. Um, in violent homes or have lived in violent homes. One of the things that I think is really, um, that's really been unveiled has to do with uh, exactly what Sherry talked about with the, the economic differential between men and women and the impact of COVID on the um, female workforce has been huge. We know that, we know that so many women are fulfilling service roles in, in employment and these are the roles that have been discontinued because of, the, um, because of COVID. They're also the women who are at greatest risk through their jobs, their nurses, their um, grocery store clerks, their, so, so women are out there doing this work and being exposed to, um, to the virus in, uh, in greater numbers than, than um, anybody else. The other thing that's being, um, I think, is, um, is being revealed is the, the reality that things can happen. So for, for, you know, for years, we've heard that there are so many things that just can't happen and suddenly they've happened. It's pretty remarkable. It's pretty remarkable. One example of that is, you know, our Department of Corrections on average has housed around 130 to 140 women in the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. Gratefully, they immediately took steps to reduce the um, population inside the facility so that they could create some physical distancing and reduce the, the risk of, of, um, of the spread of the, of the virus. And it was, I mean, within two weeks, there was, the, the population was cut nearly in half. So we know that this can happen. Now, those folks were, you know, taken to the door and, and, and our communities weren't quite ready to provide the supports that they needed, but we're working on that. It's, I mean, these, there are things that actually are possible. And I, my hope for moving forward as we move out of COVID crisis and into COVID reality that this is with us, this virus is with us, is that we don't forget that we can do these things. Thank you for saying that, Karen, because yeah. that's really 
um, probably why we've been doing this show so particularly passionately the last couple months is so that we can like really highlight and remember the things that we're learning in this time. Last week, we talked about the fact that we've managed to house every homeless person. It's remarkable. Like, right? It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, yeah. I've been, I'm really, you know, thinking about apartments and access to apartments. Um, and as we think about housing, as we think about, um, Sherry, you really highlighted how when someone um, has been in experiencing intimate partner violence for a long time, that there are a lot of aspects of life that um, they're going to carry sort of with them into the next stage, you know, so that might be a bad employment history because that's been um, sabotaged by um, their partner, or it might be a bad rental history because someone has been, you know, experiencing violence at home and people call the police repeatedly and that becomes a ding on someone's um, rental history. And so I'm curious in that context, if you all have um, ideas around sort of legislative solutions for how that legacy gets carried forward and how we can stop um, further punishing folks who have experienced so much. Yeah, I mean, yeah. love to hear from you, obviously, too, Karen. What I can tell you sort of on the ground locally, um, you know, we, we have advocates working with on, within all these different systems to make sure not just that survivors know what their own legal rights are um, in terms of employment or rental history, um, so that, you know, they have rights when domestic violence has been part of the challenge, we can help advocate around that sort of person to person. Um, systemically, you know, yeah, I think Karen could probably weigh in on that too, but I wanna just go back a little bit to also what Karen said earlier, um, this reminder, this energizing reminder that we as humans can be nimble, right? It's mm -hmm. systems potentially telling us, eh, you know, that hasn't happened, that can't happen for all these whatever reasons. The pandemic has also shown us our strengths, right? I mean, I think every day, especially the first few weeks when people couldn't even go out, um, we were still getting front row seats uh, to just the best of, of humans, right? Generosity, courage, all, you know, all of that. And even now, um, most recently, people protesting during a pandemic, you know, I think those are essential workers, right? The courage to push back on systems and injustice, even if that's with masks on, there is so much power individually and collectively that we have. And I think, yes, the pandemic has highlighted um, some of the systemic challenges we still have to work on, but it's also bringing people together in radical new ways. Um, and I think that's beautiful. And I hope really that's the legacy. So I'm sorry, that was a little bit of a detour, but systemically, Karen, you know what, I'd be curious, your thoughts too, you know, what are some legislative ways we can help people not show up to the next stage of their life with all these quote unquote demerits on their record? Well, I want to just mention that organizations like Women's Freedom Center have incredible programs in place that offer um, folks coming out of violent relationships the kinds of supports that they need. So supporting those programs. So for example, there's there are programs that um, provide uh, credit repair. So um, survivors can get a, they can enter into a relationship with a, um, with a, a financial institution with the help of an organization like um, Women's Freedom Center. And they, what happens is they get a, they get like a, um, it's called, called a match savings account. So a person will put money into an account and then um, Women's Freedom Center or the network will match it. But the way it shows up on the books is that they're repairing any kind of damaged credit. It's an incredible program, uh, and it really helps. There's also there's also program or there's also funds that are available that are issued by the state of Vermont to support emergency housing needs. So things like making sure that survivors have first month's rent, they get their utilities paid off, those kinds of things. Uh, the network um, gets seventy thousand dollars a year to uh, manage that money. We pass it directly through to our to domestic and sexual violence organizations. And, and we, we issue that every quarter. We issue $15,000 a quarter. It takes less than two weeks to run through that money. Mm -hmm. The need is so great. The, um, and then the, you know, the other thing that I think is really important for us to, to recognize is the very thing you said, Emily, about, how, um, about housing people without permanent homes. Mm -hmm. but we, we know that it's possible to get 
get folks off the street. We know that that's really possible. I would love to have us have a conversation and to adopt a housing first model mm -hmm. so that we are, we are saying to the citizens of Vermont that we recognize that housing is an issue here and we will do everything possible we can, possible, that we possibly can, get people into permanent, safe, affordable housing mm -hmm. immediately. We know from all the health outcomes, we know from all, the, all of our work with survivors that permanent, safe, affordable housing is a gateway to economic stability, yeah. to better health care outcomes for, for everybody in the family, most, you know, most poignantly children. So the, I, you know, I've been at my job for 13 years now, and I have stood on the State House steps every March on Homelessness Awareness Day and, um, and listened to speeches and made speeches. And, and then nothing seems to change. So in COVID, the opportunity has been that we can actually see that change is possible. Mm -hmm. and, and there's this opportunity right now to build on that. Mm -hmm. Vermont is poised to be a housing first state. And we have, we have you know, 15 domestic violence organizations that are working on housing issues every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, but we also have great housing advocates and great housing organizations. So Pathways is an example of that. They're doing a housing first model. It, it can be done. And, um, and I think that if we could actually actually really focus on housing first, we have a really great opportunity to help survivors. Mm -hmm. I agree. So I'm curious what strings have to be pulled or what um, systems need to be in place to switch to a housing first model? Like what's standing in our way from doing it? I think the biggest thing standing in our way from doing it is housing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. a really that's a really biggest thing. Um, we have a lot of our agencies are very very close to being with a housing first model, but yep. given how intense the shortage of housing is, especially in Wyndham County, um, folks who are jumping through hoops faster get housing earlier mm -hmm. because there's mm -hmm. such an incredible shortage. Um, and so people who are better able to fill out the housing applications, the forums, whatever, and to sort of go through those systems, um, the earlier they have housing, which in some ways, even if we're hypothetically using a housing first model and saying you don't have to succeed at services or have a job before you get this, it still becomes a by default, not a housing first model because those mm -hmm. who with sort of greater capacity wind up with housing earlier on. Um, if we didn't have this profound, painful housing shortage, uh, it would be much easier to just move people immediately from a request to a home. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really the biggest barrier. Um, the other, I think, so one of, some of the other barriers is that some of our federal money is um, really tied to housing that requires background checks, um, limits on the number of people in a unit, the limit on the family relationships and the people in the unit, the um, behavior of the people who live there. So it becomes um, a slightly policed experience living in that housing. Um, and so if you're poor, you don't have privacy. And if you're not, you do. And so that also um, takes us further away from a housing first model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I just add to that that, Please. that um, in other states we've seen really successful partnerships between um, economic development agencies, human services agencies, tax credit organizations, domestic violence, domestic and sexual violence organizations to create the kind of housing that's really needed. And so that it's not, I think this is an example of how things can get really siloed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, this housing goes over here, domestic violence goes over here, economic development over here, uh, you know, the, 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 the relationship to environmental regulations, which we hold so dear, but also creates significant challenges for people wishing to do housing development. That, so if we actually, we actually need to all come together and really think about how to solve this bricks and mortar problem in our state. I feel very hopeful right now, um, and I'm realizing now through this conversation that actually one of the few people not at the table in a conversation that I've been a part of is the Women's Freedom Center, um, and so I will remedy that after the show. <laughs>
Um, <laughs> Thank you is, for that. <laughs> absolutely. So sorry. Um, we've been having some really good conversations that was spurred on by applying for a grant that we actually did not get as a community, but we decided as a group to stay together after we didn't get the grant, which is fairly unusual. Um, and it's a conversation with our local economic development, regional development corporation, our um, community bank, our, both our housing, our nonprofit housing developer and our homeless agency, um, me there as a legislator and some other service providers to have a conversation about like really coming together and what can we do both development wise um, and then also services connected to that. And I'm hopeful that because we've had that incredible collaboration, the COVID money can become, um, we can actually do something useful with it quickly. Great. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. We, we have to, uh, pause briefly to hear from our underwriters and go to break. But the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEWLP 107.7 FM will return in a moment. Welcome back to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEWLP 107.7 Brattleboro's Community Radio Station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and if you are just joining us, we have on the show regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, who is a rep for Brattleboro, as well as Karen Tronsgaard Scott, who is with the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Welcome back, Karen. And also Sherry, who is an advocate with the Women's Freedom Center. And as always, here on the Montpelier Happy Hour, the views and opinions expressed by the host and the guests are the opinions of the host and the guest, not the radio station. And the reason I say that is because one, I'm supposed to. The, the board tells me I'm supposed to, but also <laughs> because I think we're going to start going into some potentially uncomfortable territory for both listeners and, and um, guests. And we want to, but we feel it's a conversation that needs to happen. And that is around um, being engaged bystanders, the role of police and state surveillance in some of these systems. And um, Emily, I would love to start with you because off air, you, you phrased and framed this conversation really beautifully. So I would like to start with, with you. Thank you. I hope I can do as well the second time around on that. Um, so I am curious and sort of exploring for myself what the intersection between intimate partner violence, um, violence against children, the Department of Children and Families, the police department, how all of these systems come together and um, can sometimes when we think that we're saving um, or helping do more harm than good. And so want to sort of build out a few of those conversations around that. And so one of them is um, how many of us um, who might be white or middle class um, have long-standing trusting relationships with the police um, and how that is sort of the community option when something is going wrong, that it is the police department's problem. Um, and an assumption that the police department is trained to handle the kind of really difficult dynamic situations that happens with intimate partner violence. And I know in Brattleboro, um, there's been a lot of work and a lot of conversation on this. And I know that the Women's Freedom Center has very much been at the table around police training, um, but I know there's a lot more to do. And I know that, um, in communities of color and in marginalized, other marginalized communities, um, especially poor people living in public housing, the impact of the police in a home can have outsized impacts. Um, and so I'm curious about that. And then sort of the other layer of state surveillance and state harm that I'm very aware of is how the relationship between a child being in a house where intimate partner violence is happening, um, what, the res what the responsibility of the state is to the survivor of it or the victim of intimate partner violence in that situation. Because I think the state often looks to the child rather than to the child and parent pair of survivors. Um, and often does more harm than good in that particular instance too. And so those are two dynamics that I would just like 
really love to dig into a little bit and explore and look at ways we can um, use the systems that we have that are funded with public dollars that are there hypothetically to make our community safer and more resilient, how we can use those systems in better ways to make sure that we're really um, serving folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any ideas on that big old pile? It's, it's the spot on pile that needs to be talked about for sure. Um, and I'll start with, you know, just um, the way the Women's Freedom Center approaches kind of all of that is we always start from um, trusting that survivors and you know mostly we're working with women but again that survivors are the experts on their own lives and their own situations um, not advocates right and so um, and likewise every situation is unique and so there is no unfortunately there's no one-size-fits-all safety avenue for survivors right and systems sometimes may come down quickly you know getting at what you were saying or you know alluding to Emily about for instance DCF, if they only look at the child and mandate that things have to happen because of this child, we absolutely get and have enormous respect for the mission of Department of Children and Families. But if that forces things to happen for the survivor, you know, sooner isn't always safer trying to get out. And so if there's not help putting a really solid safety plan together, the system, you know, the, the sort of cookie cutter um, expectation that things happen in a certain way can have you know, terrible consequences for survivors. So there's no one size fits all in terms of um, avenues for survivors. And survivors, like you're saying, are not all impacted equally by reaching out to law enforcement. And we absolutely recognize that. And, you know, that's on us. It's on advocates to say, um, you know, just the quality of our listening has to include all of those different strands. And um, if, any survivor for whatever reason um, feels like, no, 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 I can't bring the police into this situation. We trust that, right? That is not the only way to get to safety. And of course, there's a whole other conversation burrowed in there about police training um, and accountability, et cetera, et cetera. And you can have some of that conversation, but we start from the place that um, we know there's no one size, you know, uh, like I said, one size fits all safety option for survivors. So we try to let them be in the lead. Karen, do you want to add, would you like to add to that? I can't resist adding um, <laughs> that. Good. <laughs> and I'm going to go big. Um, Please. So we have to recognize, in, especially in this moment in time, that our society is built around a bunch of assumptions that privilege white people over people of color, privilege people with money over people that don't have money. And, um, and within that, I'm going to call it a white supremacy culture. Within that white supremacy culture, there are a couple things that um, that we're, we're talking about that are really present for um, for folks who are experiencing domestic violence. One of them is this idea of um, of, a, of a savior complex. This idea that um, that there's that survivors of domestic violence and Sherry touched on this are not the experts of their lives. That they require somebody to come in and save them. Nothing could be further from the truth. Survivors of domestic violence are surviving every day of the of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that happens is around the paternalization of systems. So we see this so frequently when survivors reach out into systems filled with really good, well-intended people who want to do a good job. But the system pushes, um, pushes, pushes people who are providing the services into a paternalized role. So again, this is Sherry touched on this, this idea that survivors don't know their own lives. We know that, um, so I guess the third thing I would say is, there, is, the, um, is our criminal legal systems are um, both really wrapped up in this notion of heroism and wrapped up in this notion of paternalism. Mm -hmm. And this isn't the fault of any single person. This is a requirement of white supremacy because ultimately the white, white supremacy requires us to lose our humanity, to, to, especially as white people. It's one of the ways we manifest our privilege is through not seeing the humanity of people. So it's really easy for white folks doing this work, including me, this is something I'm really working on, is to lose my own humanity. And when I lose my own humanity, I lose the humanity of the people that I'm working with. There's an assumption out there that, um, 
especially coming from folks like me, white middle class people, that the most important thing and the best thing we can do is to call the police. The police have definitely a role in responding to uh, domestic assault. But we also know that around 80% of survivors in our state have no desire to have any interaction with the criminal legal system. It just doesn't match what, they, what their outcomes are. It's not, there's nothing wrong. There's just, it just doesn't match. The, um, and so when a survivor does call the police, we have to pay really close attention to that because that means they need help now. But we have to have options and we have to have um, ways of thinking about domestic violence survivors that operate outside of the criminal legal system and give them lots of, of options for getting help outside of the criminal legal system and getting help that recognizes their own autonomy and um, knowledge of their lives. Thanks. And I think this really does come down to you know, outcomes that one can expect, because I think if, you know, if it were universally helpful to reach out and get help from whatever organization, including law enforcement, we wouldn't see the kind of hesitance, right, that, that can happen. So that's what we need to work on, um, is, is making sure that um, there is adequate, respectful um, help out there for people when, they, when and if they choose to reach out. The other part is, you know, I mean, survivors, there's often um, this catch-22. One, there's, you know, am I going to get treated like a, you know, like a human being by reaching out for help? But the flip side, too, is, you know, they're up against the batterer right behind them, and how is that going to impact that batterer? And survivors, for their own safety, have to navigate that, right? And so um, they also very often opt out because, you know what, I know if I, that's a tipping point. If I do that, he's gonna go ballistic. So if I can just navigate slightly under the radar from that, put this or that step in place, let me do that. So yes, absolutely, it's at either end of that spectrum that we have to look. What are survivors really up against that can have people from the outside maybe thinking, well, why didn't they just call the police or da da da? There's no just, why didn't they just do that? Um, this is fleeing we're talking about, right? This is having to really walk a fine line between the dangerous batterer behind me and the maybe equally dangerous culture out ahead of me. Is anyone gonna have my back when I get out there, right? And that's where we still are. You know, we've obviously come a long way in our culture. Yay, activism, um, but we still have a long way to go. We're somewhere in the middle. Well, and I think we also have to acknowledge too that depending on who the batterer is, what type of social collateral they may have within their own community mm -hmm. and who is their best friend and who, I guess I'm saying this because a lot of the folks I know who uh, tend to <laughs> have been very manipulative or um, kind of operating on the, on the more shadowed side of, of life, um, they're really good at putting forward a good face and setting up a different story than perhaps the the reality of that's going on in the home. Yeah, and spot on. I think for you know um, a lot of you know a lot of domestic violence. Absolutely, things can look great from the driveway, right? That family dynamic can look great from the driveway, and we may have no idea, even as advocates, what exactly is happening behind closed doors. But I also wanna to touch on something, Emily, that you said earlier that's so spot on. You know, there's, there's a misperception in our culture, one, that survivors aren't, you know, strong or need this sort of extra support, but also that, you know, in certain cultures or demographics, it might be happening more frequently, which we know isn't true, right? If you are poor, you're likely to have less privacy. So maybe people, maybe your neighbors are closer than if you're wealthy and it's summer, you don't have AC, so everybody's windows are open, so people can hear what's happening, the police are called. So it can look a certain way, but you know, if you're wealthy and you've got a super long driveway and you've got a credit card and you can just tuck yourself into a hotel for a weekend when things are escalated, you might not need to call a shelter and your numbers not, might not be getting counted, but it's everywhere and absolutely a huge part of how batterers hold their sort of power and control dynamic together is by this, um, you know, two-faced persona, I would say, right? What the survivor and, and kids potentially are living with behind closed doors and what we as the culture see. And that person may well be, you know, great out in the community, but that doesn't mean that crime that's happening behind closed doors isn't also a community problem to deal with. I think that's particularly 
difficult in our small towns um, where we have, you know, relationships that go back um, generations and perceptions and stories about each other that go back generations and um, multiple overlapping relationships from, you know, like banking to grocery store to, um, you know, ex-boyfriends of ex-girlfriends from high school. And so how all of that plays out in people's ability to sort of step up and listen deeply to someone who's challenging a story that they have about someone that they've known or respected, I think is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Can I just add something to that? Mm. You've touched you don't on have to really... ask permission to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Jump right in. <laughs> you and I have had many conversations over coffee, right? Um, the, you know, the, the other thing I think that's really important to understand is that um, people who use coercion and violence in their intimate partner relationships are all around us. We know them. We, we all of us know them, know these folks. They're, they're not monsters. They're, uh, you know, our friends, our brothers, our, our sometimes our sisters, uh, you know, they're, they're all around us. And to the extent that we characterize these folks as being monsters, it, it, it blinds us. Yeah. The reality that they're, they're, they're with us. Mm -hmm. And we lose the opportunity to have substantive conversations, honest conversations about how they're interacting with their loved one. And we miss the opportunity to actually support change. For yes. Coercion. And, you know, and I think that the, the, you know, the other thing that about this conversation I think is important for us to remember is that domestic violence happens along an arc. It's not a singular incident. So, so at the point at which a, a police officer might be called, there has been so much that's gone on. Uh, and our system is ill-prepared, regardless of how much training, and, you know, I've provided a lot of training over the years to law enforcement officers, and it has had good impact. But the system ultimately is designed to intervene in a singular instance. Yes. Mm. And we're talking about a long arc mm -hmm. of incidents, and many survivors have no desire to leave. Mm -hmm. Some of the survivors don't want to leave because it's just not safe to do that. But some of them live in communities where they're, they're, they're the, the foundation of the community. Uh, their, their, their role in the community is, is vitally important. They're, um, role in the, in the microculture that they live in is vitally important. They can, cannot possibly leave. So we also have to think about how to support those survivors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate um, naming that this is, um, that folks that are involved in this are neither monsters nor outsized victims, that this is a part of regular life. Mm -hmm. And I think um, two pieces of that for me is that you know, I've had conversations with men close to me about like, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're, you know, one of your closest friends has raped a woman before. And they'll be like, no, there's no way they're good guys. I'm like, well, if every woman I know has been raped, I don't think it's just like one guy going around doing all of it. Like, that's just not really the way the world works. And so like thinking in sort of the systems or oriented rather than event oriented way, I think is really important for us to understand um, what's happening in our communities and facing it. The other yeah, piece... I mean Oh, sorry. No, please go. I was just going to say to touch on that as well, you know, and, you know, we still have, I mean, there have been so many, you know, back-to-back -back crises that it's, you know, rewinding back just a little bit when Me Too was making all the news and continues to make all the news. It's just highlighted that, right? Like this, um, it is all around us and it, it doesn't mean that that person is consistently in their life horrible they may be wonderful they may be funny they may be famous they may be brilliant etc cetera, etc cetera. you know the, the the bigger pandemic here is this notion of privilege to mm -hmm. to harm somebody right that's what's buried here whether it's to sexually harm or physically harm or block someone's airway mm -hmm. you know all of that that's the huge atrocity here is that 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 kind of sense of entitlement coexists with amazing activism, right? We have made progress. There are wiser voices out there um, creating change and every year there's more allies, et cetera, including more male allies, because we know that this is not, it plays out in a gendered way sort of statistically, but it's not about gender. It's not genetic, right? Um, it's about behavior. It's about this, this choice of behavior that perpetrators tend to get away with. And it's also important to just underscore the reason we have the numbers we have is not that, um, you know, yes, one in three women will experience domestic or sexual violence at some point in her life. That's staggering. But who are these men? It's not that the equivalent ratio of men are perpetrators. 
most men are actually not using this kind of behavior, but the ones who are, it's a serial behavior. They're doing it again and again. So it's not like, you know, they're a, a dangerous partner to Sally, but then they're a great partner, healthy partner to Jane. And then this is their whole life spectrum, right? And so each perpetrator is actually causing enormous, enormous harm um, to the survivors that they've dated. Right. And that's what we need to look at systemically is how do we hold those account those offenders accountable? How do we make sure we're not raising up the next generation to just repeat all of this? And potentially, hopefully, how do we shift the thinking of the of the seasoned batterer? You know, and that's an open ended question as to how possible that is. But that's where we need to look across that whole spectrum. So one thing I think about on that when I am thinking right. about legislation that might be a solution or policy or administrative changes that might be part of a solution is how the dynamics of violence and surveillance in the home, which are, you know, exactly what we're talking about when we talk about intimate partner violence, it's surveillance and violence and sometimes surveillance as violence, that those same dynamics aren't what we are repeating um, on a community level, on an administrative level, on a governance level, in order to try to remedy that harm. Because it's just, a, you know, they're each microcosms of the other. And so when we use um, states to sponsor violence and surveillance as a way of remedying intimate partner violence and surveillance, we're still giving into that same dynamics of white supremacy and patriarchy, et cetera, that we yes. see in yes. Me Too, that we see everywhere else. And so, we need to be really, really careful that when we're building remedies, we're not just, um, you know, ironing in or weaving in those same dynamics. One, yeah. 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 So unfortunately, we are just about out of time. But I think we pulled on one very important thread that I want to try to address before we, the clock runs out. And that's that issue that sometimes calling the police is not the best way to help someone. And so how do we support our community members who well-meaning want to do the right thing? Um, but if calling the police is not necessarily the best option, what else can they do? Go ahead, Sherry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, you know, always um, when it's possible to actually have um, some safe communication with the survivor, letting that survivor lead, right? Unless any of us is actually witnessing um, somebody, you know, at risk of serious imminent physical danger. In that case, 911 is the fastest way to try to get some skilled intervention. But again, as we've seen, right, that's not an automatic safety way out either. But that's when it comes down to that. Um, certainly bystanders at that point, right? That's the fastest way to get some help going there. But anything less than that, you know, since we've, we've run out of time, um, the Women's Freedom Center put out a column recently that folks can still look up, Brattleboro Reformer, it's called Creating a Lifeline, How We Can Help Survivors During This Crisis. And it looks at some of the different ways that, you know, if we're all still kind of shut in, survivors tend to already be fairly isolated even before all this right now but I mean before all this but right now they may just have a 20 minute window to go to the store assuming they're even quote unquote allowed to go alone what are some ways we can um, you know store owners or other shoppers might be available to provide maybe a safe phone to a survivor those are some ways right let the survivor make their own decision whether they want to call our hotline or reach out for help so some of it is that if you know neighbors friends family know that a survivor is in danger um, they can absolutely call our crisis hotline and talk to an advocate about what are some of the safe ways I could help this person. I know it's not automatic that I should just be calling law enforcement. Um, you know, again, no one size fits all. Every situation is unique. And also every bystander's, you know, sense of their comfort zone with intervening is gonna vary. So they can call our 24 seven hotline also if they wanna run something by. And that number, you know, folks can find it on our website, womensfreedomcenter.net, but our hotline is 
And year round, we get, you know, really thoughtful questions from bystanders that call us with just this kind of thing. And we've gotten some more now during, you know, this, um, the quarantine, because people are home more and they're maybe hearing more of what their neighbor's lives are really like, right? Or they're hearing escalation and what do I do? I don't want to cause a, a, you know, unintended chain reaction for that person. So they're, they're beautiful questions because they, they show that people are getting a grasp of what somebody's really up against. And that's the best safety net any of us can ever have, um, is that we live in a community that understands not only domestic violence, but racial violence, and doesn't just automatically take the reins away from that person, but actually offers some solidarity to that person. How can I help you? What would be helpful to you? And I think that's the sort of bottom line there. Karen? And for me to add one small thing, I, I really appreciate all of that. The, the, uh, and I just want to say, if I had my wish, if my wish could come true, everything that Sherry just described would exist in, in, all, in all of our communities in Vermont. In addition, to, in addition to that, people who knew people who were using violence and, and coercion in their intimate partner relationships would feel like they could step in. They would feel like they could say things like, I'm really worried about how I see you're interacting with your wife or your partner. Mm -hmm. I'm really worried about the way you're talking to your kids. How can I help you think about this? Yeah. Yeah. What can I do to support? Because I know in your heart you don't want to do this. So how can we think together about supporting you to, to change in this? How can I, you know, can I act as a, as a place where you can call when you feel like you're, you know, when you feel like things are about to explode? Can I, can I point you in the direction of programming that exists in our state for people just like you who use you know, violence and, and coercion. There's, there's that conversation. Uh, I feel like we have, we just kind of missed that conversation mm -hmm. and folks aren't talking to their friends and their family members who, who use violence until the police get called. Yeah. yeah. One quick thing, if I can just quickly piggyback, um, love what you said, Karen, totally agree. Um, a lot of the different kinds of trainings that the Women's Freedom Center offers year round anyway, um, unpacking the gender box, bystander empowerment to help end, you know, sexual harassment in the workplace, police training, et cetera, et cetera, um, is still available. So if there are organizations that, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, their employees have some more time on their hands right now, how about a Zoom conversation and a training, right, um, to talk about some of these things? Because, yeah, it's, you know, any one of us as a human may have, you know, challenges being an outspoken bystander. So let's talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you so much, uh, Karen Tronsgaard Scott from the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Thank you so much, uh, Sherry, who's an advocate with the Women's Freedom Center. As you can tell, we only scraped the surface of this conversation, but thank you for, for bringing your, your insight and your expertise to this this show. Uh, Emily, if people need to find you or have questions, uh, how do they do that? They can find me at a weekly um, legislative roundtable that I host with the two other Brattleboro legislators. That's every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. via Zoom, and the information for that can be found on Front Porch Forum or on my Facebook page, which is um, Emily Kornheiser, and then you can also find me on Twitter as E. Kornheiser and um, Instagram as Emily Kornheiser. And I have a website, emilykornheiser.org. It's very nice sometimes to have a name like Emily Kornheiser because the <laughs> URLs are all mine. Um, also, please feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Again, easy to find with the Google. Fantastic. And I am your host, Olga Peters. This is the Montpelier Happy Hour on WBWLP Brattleboro 107.7 FM. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. We'll talk next week. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.